and Ross. Okay, so we're starting the respiratory system today, and it follows pretty well from the cardiovascular system because, of course, we've got the pulmonary circuit, which relates directly to the respiratory system, and uh, we've also done blood fairly recently, and we discussed a lot about how the whole point of having red blood cells is to drop off oxygen at tissues that require it. Um, but what we haven't really done is expressed or talked about how exactly that happens. So the respiratory system chapter does cover that. So we'll spend some time doing some anatomy, and then we'll move on to the physiology of it. So with regard to functions, so why have a respiratory system, um, the main function is gas exchange. So that is taking useful molecules, harvesting them from the air, and then dumping molecules that are not useful into the environment. So we breathe in oxygen and we breathe carbon dioxide out as a waste product of oxidative metabolism. So gas exchange is the goal. Moving air is how we achieve that. Sound production is a bonus. So you don't need sound production to live, but it is sure a handy feature of being alive because that means that I can communicate things to you uh, at a distance. And then olfaction is another benefit of this. So the ability to take in air and smell it and detect chemical cues. With regard to other functions that are sort of ancillary or included, we've got protection. And protection refers to if you're going to exchange things with the air, one thing that is benefit beneficial to do is to make sure that the stuff that you're taking in is as much as you can perform this free of pathogens. Now, no air is ever going to be free of pathogens, and this includes bacteria and viruses, but also noxious chemicals, particulate matter, pollutants, etc. cetera. Um, and also, you lose a significant amount of water from your body just by breathing it out. So this is why we you know, can breathe on a mirror and draw a smiley face, for example. There's water vapor in your breath, a lot of it. So we have a respiratory defense system, which is basically a fancy series of mucous membranes. And those membranes are designed to trap particulate matter from the air and then move it up your airway and either into your pharynx so that you can swallow it. So this is the movement of the mucus via cilia towards your pharynx. Uh, or you can just make a disgusting sound and hawk it up and spit it out. Either way, you're clearing pathogens and particulate matter from your system, which is a net positive physiologically. So this picture is showing you a hematoxylin and eosin stain of the respiratory epithelium. You can see abundant and very long cilia, as well as pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells interspersed with goblet cells. And you can see the pore here by which the mucus exits the goblet cell and goes onto the top of the cilia. Basal cells are gonna be dividing to replace lost epithelial cells. And then we have the underlying lamina propria, which is the loose connective tissue that supports the epithelium. So the cooperative efforts between this epithelium and the mucus is called the mucociliary escalator or mucociliary elevator. Um, which just refers to the fact that trapped particulates are pushed by the cilia in the mucus up and out of your airway. Hang on just a second. I'm trying to bring back this and also get my chat back. It's nice to be able to have the... Uh... Darn it. Okay, I guess I can't. I'm going to move the chat down here for a moment, so please don't write anything in it for a second so that I can um, move it back up. No? Nope. All right. Well, fine then. I like being able to see what I'm doing on both screens, but apparently Zoom is not going to cooperate in that regard today. So. All right, so I'm gonna actually pause recording here.
Awesome. Okay, so bronchi and lobules. Uh, lobules are just subdivisions of the lung tissue. So they are going to be um, sorry about that. They're going to be basically uh, all of the alveolar sacs that arise from one path down the airway. So for lab, specifically the histology section of lab, you're going to need to know which tissues are present in each portion of the airway. Oops, excuse me. Um, and also the functions of each tissue. So just to give you an example, uh, the function of respiratory epithelium, which uh, is the epithelium that covers the airway, not the alveoli, that is to trap particulate matter and move mucus. The function of the alveolar epithelium would be gas exchange, short and sweet, very nice. Um, and then you need to know that, for example, respiratory epithelium does not do gas exchange, so it's only good for trapping particulate matter. Likewise, the purpose of the alveolar epithelium is for gas exchange, therefore it is simple squamous epithelium. Now, to be very, very clear, uh, because it, it keeps coming up in histology tests, um, not just in this class, but in others as well, um, and so I, I try to warn students about this just because I wanna be clear about what the expectation is regarding answering questions for the practical, and Although you are responsible for knowing which tissues are present in every part of the respiratory system, that is so that you can identify them. So if I point to something and you see that it is appearing to be a cross section of a ball and it's made out of squamous epithelium, those are your visual cues that you are looking at an alveolus. I'm not going to ask you what tissue type is this made out of? So the answer to these kinds of things will not anymore be simple squamous epithelium. We tested you on your ability to recognize epithelia and connective tissues in 241. We're done with that now. Now you use that information to identify larger, more complex things. Okay, so alveolar organization. The reason that you have lungs that are shaped the way you do, and the reason that they appear the way they do histologically, is so that you can fit a lot of surface area, which is critical for the exchange of gases, into a relatively small space, which is your thorax. So your lungs, while relatively small, contain orders of magnitude larger surface area inside of them as the result of having millions and millions and millions of alveoli. So alveolar organization is an important thing to understand here. So what you're seeing here is a cross section of a group of alveoli. So if I go back one, we're looking at the inside of this clump of alveoli. And notice that on the outside, there are alveolar capillaries, which surround each individual alveolus those capillaries arise from branches of the pulmonary arteries and they give rise to branches of the pulmonary veins. So these veins are going to take oxygen-rich blood back to the heart to be delivered to the left atrium and then the left atrium and ventricle are going to cooperate to deliver that blood to the system. So the physical wall of the alveoli is made out of a type of alveolar cell called a type 1 alveolar cell. So these are just designed to be thin and flat, thin enough to perform gas exchange. That's all. So we call this the alveolar epithelium. Alveolar cells under normal circumstances are squamous or squames, meaning that they're thin and flat. You also have alveolar macrophages. So here's one right here. Let me get my little laser. So here's one right here. Um, these actually crawl around the inner surface of your alveolar alveoli. So um, if you think back to chapter four of your textbook, that's the histology chapter, um, one of the ideas in chapter four was the idea that certain cell populations in the connective tissue are what is called fixed, meaning they stay there, and other populations are wandering 
meaning they travel in the blood and kind of move between connective tissue and the blood. So alveolar macrophages are a group of macrophages that are considered to be fixed, meaning that they stay in the lungs. It does not mean that they stay in one spot inside of the lungs. They don't do that. So these guys crawl around on the inside of your alveoli and they gobble up dust and particulate matter and pollutants and tar if you're a smoker of any kind. Um, so they're wandering inside of the lungs only. So we also call these uh, dust cells. So alveolar macrophages are also called dust cells. And these are one of the reasons, along with the regenerative properties of type 1 alveolar cells. Um, so let's say you're a smoker and you decide, okay, you know what, it's time. It's time to stop smoking. Assuming you're not an extremely heavy smoker who has developed COPD or emphysema, as long as you quit and stay quit, your lungs will regenerate back to their original form. There will be cell turnover and new type 1 alveolar cells will be born, and your alveolar macrophages will be able to catch up at eating up all the particulate matter that's built up in your lungs. So over time, you get a regain of lung function after quitting smoking. Finally, we've got type 2 alveolar cells, also called septal cells. So these are these little sort of sea anemone looking guys. Um, they're not squamous and flat, and they have lots of microvilli as well. So type 2 alveolar cells are very, very important. Um, they secrete a substance called surfactant. So to explain what I mean by surfactant, I'm going to use an analogy because it's easier to understand new and challenging concepts if you can think about something that's kind of familiar. So you know those thin plastic bags that you get at certain grocery stores? like the little brownish Safeway bags or the whitish other kinds of bags, those ones that are super thin and super cheap. If you get the inside of one of those wet, which, you know, can happen if you something spills in your groceries or whatever, you'll probably have noticed that due to the wetness of the inside of the bag and the relative flimsiness of the material, the sides of the bag stick together. They cling. The alveoli are very, very thin. And in order for gas exchange to occur, you have to have a moist interface. So it's required that your lungs not be dry. But that creates a problem, and that problem is surface tension. So water wants to hydrogen bond with itself, which would want to stick this alveolar wall to this one, for example. So the surface tension of water and the presence of thin films of water on the inside of your alveoli creates this propensity for your alveoli to want to stick shut. Surfactant is what prevents that from happening. So surfactant is a substance that is an amphipathic molecule. So it has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic component. And this is enough to disrupt the hydrogen bonding of water and prevent the sticking together of the alveoli. So uh, some applied science regarding surfactant specifically. And if you're in this course because you want to be um, a nurse, and I know that you know every now and then I have a student that really wants to be a uh, neonatal nurse, for example. One of the key pieces of development that has to be finished before an infant is born is sufficient lung development to have septal cells that work and be able to secrete surfactant. If an infant is born prematurely enough that they, they don't have surfactant cells, uh, you get something called infant respiratory distress syndrome, which is where the neonate is unable to inflate their lungs fully and without an extreme amount of work because every time they take a breath in, they have to overcome the surface tension of water sticking their alveoli together and reinflate their alveoli. For most of us, we do this one time, and that's when we take our first breath, and then never again. But if you are a neonate who is born premature and you don't have enough surfactant, you have to reinflate and reopen your alveoli every time you breathe. So this results in a clinical observation for preemies called costal breathing, 
And that is, if you look at these poor little babies, you see that um, their intercostal muscles are working extremely hard to, to help them get air in. And you can see evidence of that if you look at their thorax. So this is a, a major challenge for premature neonates. Fortunately, however, um, we have pretty good technology for neonatal intensive care. And that includes uh, ventilators and oxygen chambers, as well as artificial surfactant. But in times of old, uh, that would basically make or break survival for a neonate. Okay, so let's talk about the respiratory membrane itself. So we have endothelium, which is the squamous endothelium of the capillaries surrounding each alveolus. And we've got a thin fused basal lamina, which is shared between the endothelium and the alveolar epithelium. And all of these three things together in a sandwich are only half a micron. So half of one one thousandth of a millimeter. Very, very thin. This is important because the rate of diffusion is calculated by taking a bunch of different factors, including permeability of a membrane, and then dividing all of that by diffusion distance. So the bigger diffusion distance, the smaller the fraction becomes, and that drives down the rate of diffusion. So we have to have this really tiny distance so that diffusion across this interface is quick. So everybody take a quick breath in and a quick breath out with me. That was diffusion happening fast enough that even though that breath was relatively short, I successfully harvested billions of oxygen molecules from the air and I diffused billions of CO2 molecules out, right? So keeping this distance short is critical to lung health. The endothelium is also the site where angiotensin converting enzyme is created and expressed. So remember from the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, uh, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 in the lungs by ACE. This is where that is. So all of this surface area together represents an extremely large surface area compared with your body surface. So it's about 35 times your body surface area. Um, obviously this is gonna vary depending on size of person, right? So a very small human is gonna have smaller lungs versus a larger human is gonna have larger lungs. But regardless, like 700 to 1500 square feet, this is like very small to like okayish apartment size. Right? So it's a lot of surface area crammed into your lungs. I once saw a, one of those like, did you know factoid things on Instagram? Um, and it took me a second to get the joke, but it was like, it began. Did you know that if you took all of your alveoli and laid them out on a flat surface, you'd die? <laughs> Which made me laugh very hard because I was expecting some sort of like impressive comparative number or whatever, but instead it was just pointing out the obvious and that is that if you smeared your lungs all over a tennis court, you wouldn't be alive. Okay, so pleural cavities and pleural membranes. These are analogous to the pericardial cavities and membranes of the heart. So remember from the pericardium, we had a layer lining the heart itself, and then a fluid-filled space, and then a layer facing away from the space. Same deal with the pleura. So the two pleural cavities surround each lung. The visceral pleura lines the lung surface, and it's a mesothelium. So it is a layer of squamous mesothelium covering over a very, very thin layer of loose connective tissue. That's all it is. Um, then there's a potential space. And when I say potential, I mean ordinarily the visceral and parietal layers of the pleura are stuck together with a thin film of pleural fluid between them. And then we have the parietal layer, which lines the inside of the thorax. So this also has an important clinical ramification, and that is the following. Inside of the lungs, in the alveoli, 
you need to oppose the surface tension of water. So you need to prevent the walls of your alveoli from sticking together. In the pleural cavity, you are relying on the surface tension of water to stick this membrane to this one. Why? Well, what that means is when you expand your thorax, take a deep breath in, you're pulling your diaphragm down and that's changing the volume of your pleural spaces. You want the outer surface of your lungs to stick to the parietal pleura. So as the parietal pleura gains volume with the diaphragm, the visceral pleura is sticking to it and changing the volume inside of your lungs. So this is a weird duality where on the inside of your lungs, you do not want surface area of water or surface tension of water. But on the outside of your lungs, in your pleural cavity, you rely on it to make sure that you can change your thoracic and lung volume and breathe in. Uh, clinical application of this, if anything compromises the uh, integrity of the pleural cavity, such as air getting in there or blood getting in there, it impairs the ability of the individual to expand their lungs. So air in the pleural cavity is called pneumothorax, that's spelled P-N-E-U-M-O-T-H-O-R-A-X, pneumothorax. Blood in the pleural cavity is called hemothorax. And uh, an excess of pleural fluid, typically due to some problem with uh, irritation or sometimes with other fluid causes is called pleural effusion. But regardless, you don't want stuff in your pleural cavity because it impairs your ability to inflate your lungs and can even cause your lungs to collapse. Okay, so respiration has many definitions. So in exam questions, that means that you have to pay a special attention to the specific context in which respiration is used. Don't make assumptions. There will be context clues in addition to the word respiration that will help guide you towards which particular meaning the question is asking about, and either it will be directly stated or you're meant to infer it from the choices before you. So make sure that you remember that respiration has more than one definitions so that when you get to its use in an exam, you're not confused. So external rep respiration is pulmonary ventilation, so taking air into your lungs. That results in exchanging gases between your alveoli and your blood. So transport of O2 into your blood, transport of CO2 out of your blood. So gas exchange inside of the alveolus is counting as external re respiration. Internal respiration is when your blood drops off oxygen at your tissues. Both of these kinds of respiration are in the service of cellular respiration. So why do we do this at all? Well, we need to deliver oxygen to our mitochondria so that the mitochondria can use oxygen as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. If that fails to happen, we get a backup of the electron transport chain, we get free radical formation, we get leaky mitochondria, and we get a reduction in ATP production, which ultimately kills us. So cellular respiration is why we do the other two. Regarding pulmonary ventilation, this is the first step to delivering oxygen to your cells and tissues, and it requires that we move air. So although I know that none of you really signed up for this to be a physics class, uh, like everything else, physiology of people and of organisms obeys the laws of the universe, which we call physics. So how stuff works in general. So we rely on physical rules and principles to allow us to ventilate our lungs and to allow us to move gases across fluid interfaces and so forth. So we have to talk a little bit about that. So we're gonna talk about how that works on terms of air movement, on terms of pressure changes, and what that means for how breathing works and what happens when parts of those mechanisms are impaired. So with air movement, 
air moves due to pressure differences. So we talked about pressure differences a little bit when we were discussing the uh, pressure differences and changes that cause opening and closing of heart valves and movement of blood through the heart in different ways. Same deal with air. So air doesn't behave any differently than any other substance. It moves along a gradient from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. And the pressure is dictated by changes in volume. So this picture is showing you a windstorm in a tropical location, not sure which, probably Hawaii. So if you pay attention to the weatherman on the news, which I know is an increasingly uncommon thing to do because who watches the news for the weather? Certainly not me. I just look at it on my phone. Um, if you pay attention to the weatherman, they will describe things to you like, we've got a low pressure system coming in or a high pressure system coming in. What they're talking about is masses of expanding or contracting air that are changing the pressure in that area, and that's what causes wind. So if you have a low pressure system crossing over your area, that low pressure system is attracting air, air particles from nearby, and that's gonna create windiness in your area. So we live with the consequences of pressure differentials and pressure flow every day. That's what wind does and is. So now we're gonna apply these same principles to the pleural cavity. So how do I make the pressure in my pleural cavity such that I can make air go inside of me or out? Oops. So I mentioned my diaphragm previously, and this is what I meant. So at rest, your diaphragm is dome-shaped. So this is a diaphragm that is not actively contracting, and here's what it looks like from the side. So this is the beginning state. When you inhale, you are contracting your diaphragm and drawing it downward, and that creates a larger space in your pleural cavity. And then your lungs stick to the parietal pleura and follow along, so they gain volume, as does the thorax. So pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So that means the larger the pressure, the lower the volume, and vice versa. So pressure, and this shouldn't say equals, it's proportional to, because we're assuming uh, constant conditions like temperature, for example. So pressure is proportional to the inverse of volume, or one over volume. So as the volume is increasing, pressure is decreasing compared to the atmosphere. Because at atmospheric pressure, unless you go way far up or way far down, it doesn't really change. So the thing you're changing in the short term is your internal pressure. So if I make the pressure in my thorax lower than atmospheric pressure, that means I'm taking air in. So I'm sucking air down into my lungs by changing pressure alone. Same thing happens when you breathe out. So when you relax your diaphragm, your diaphragm becomes more dome-shaped, and that allows air to leave because now the pressure inside of my thorax is greater than atmospheric pressure. So this is the law of physics that determines whether or not you can breathe. This is also why the diaphragm is the prime muscle of respiration and why the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm, is clinically important. So anything that damages the phrenic nerve contains a risk that you would lose innervation of the diaphragm and therefore the ability to breathe, which is obviously bad news, right? Compliance. So we also call this pulmonary compliance. Um, cardiac compliance is also a thing. So the ease with which the ventricles expand to fill with blood, we are talking here about pulmonary compliance. So the ease of expansion of the lungs. You want your lungs to be stretchy enough to expand. So because of what they're made of, lungs are spongy and stretchy. And it's a, it's a crying shame that we're not able to be in the cadaver lab this term because you would be able to feel this on the cadaver lungs. Um, you can feel what a healthy lung feels like even in death. 
you can also feel what a diseased lung feels like because one of our cadavers died of small cell lung carcinoma, which really changes the cells and the compliance of the lungs a lot. So changes in compliance are basically bad for breathing. So uh, alveolar damage, for example, emphysema, but there's others, increases compliance. So the lungs become increasingly easy to expand, um, which sounds like it would be good, but it actually creates issues. So emphysema creates confluent alveoli. So like three or four alveoli will combine due to inflammation to become one. And this represents an inc increase in compliance, but a loss in gas exchange. Fibrosis decreases compliance, and that's because connective tissue is not as stretchy as lung tissue. Reduced surfactant secretion also causes alveolar collapse, and that causes a reduction in compliance because it's harder to expand lung tissue that is collapsed due to surface tension of water. And thoracic cage mobility changes will also change compliance. So for example, if you have reduced mobility in your uh, vertebrocostal joints, the joint between your vertebrae and your ribs, then your thorax is not expandable and it creates issues with expanding your lungs. So let's take a break now. Um,